Hi, thanks for coming. Uh, my name's John McFarlane. Um, I work at A9 in Palo Alto, California, and uh, I'd like to share some of the ideas that I've um, um, discovered about numeric types in C++ recently. Uh, first, a little bit about uh, what I'm doing here. Uh, so my background is game development. I, sp I spent a, a good few years working in games. Um, um, and this is an industry where there's, um, you know, traditionally uh, quite a quite low code reuse, uh, shall we say. And often uh, even parts of the STL will get reinvented by many different um, game studios in order to um, maybe eke a little more performance out of machines. And uh, sometimes that's worthwhile, not always. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, I found out about the, the study group 14, which is a place where um, game developers and other um, people interested in low latency um, uh, domains um, are supposed, uh, you know, invited to connect with the, the, the C++ committee for future, uh, mutual benefit. And, um, and I, I was playing around with a fixed point numeric type at the time and discovering some of the, the awesome features of C++11 that make this uh, um, a great time to, to be working on numeric types and floated the idea on the, the SG14 forums and uh, before I knew it, I was presenting a, a proposal. Um, and then um, didn't get very far without um, learning all about the study group six, um, which is uh, concerned with numerics. Um, their aim is to produce a, a technical specification uh, containing all things numeric, numeric types, uh, various utilities. And um, um, the, the more I look into it, the, the more I realize, realize this is a, like a, a huge area. It's um, um, ev everywhere people are, you know, um, there are applications that are need to um, crunch numbers for a whole bunch of re reasons. Um, um, machine learning is, you know, gets a lot of press at the moment. Also, though, um, kind of orthogonal to that, um, information security is, it, it's the kind of stuff that makes it onto the actual real news. It's uh, um, and not in a good way either. Um, so I'm trying to uh, put the case for my fixed point type in, in a broader context that uh, uh, includes um, many other numeric types doing uh, performing all sorts of jobs and so uh, I've written a paper um, trying to um, show how I think um, we should progress with this and this is kind of the um, the talk of the paper so um, uh, also um, kind of um, while that's going on uh, in SG14 um, we are talking about um, producing one or more um, more or less production quality libraries, um, kind of like the way, um, you know, great stuff goes into Boost, um, gets some uh, time to um, get all the, the wrinkles ironed out and then um, c makes it to the standard. Um, it's, it seems like a good idea that you, you want to get a lot of eyes on, on the stuff that you're doing. Prototypes and, and uh, spitballing is great, but, uh, but um, giving some, some baking time is, is also useful. So uh, if anybody has uh, any, any thoughts on that, uh, um, we're, we're um, starting a discussion about, about that kind of approach. Okay, so that's the background. Quick disclaimer, um, this is quite a short talk, so um, there's a whole bunch of stuff I'm not gonna um, talk about. Uh, you can you, feel free to raise it, feel free to ask any questions, provide feedback, but don't be disappointed that there aren't any slides on um, specifically about um, the topic that interests you most because it's a, it's a very broad um, broad topic. Okay, so here's, here's my pitch. Um, my mission statement is I want to do for int what the STL does for arrays, basically. Um, I think that uh, as a C++ library writer, there's, there's no better inspiration than the STL. And specifically, there are some interesting parallels to be drawn in terms of usability, um, safety, abstraction, and um, and so also, what's the single best quality of the the standard template library? Um, there's a hint in the title of my talk. It's composability. Um, this stuff, it's um, it doesn't take too long to understand what's going on with you know really quite 
uh, complex and powerful um, expressions. And uh, I, I think that's a, that's a good inspiration for moving forwards. Um, composing, composability is a good thing. Even when it's, well, the best, the best jokes are like two jokes put together. Okay. So, um, how can I tell if my type is uh, composite? Well, I'm going to go through um, four telltale signs um, that you have a composite type, um, which is a good thing. Um, you should be able to choose a, a built-in integer type as the building block for your composite type. Um, the more easy you can replace built-ins with your type, the better things are likely to be. Not only is this uh, useful for retrofitting an existing code base with some shiny new functionality, but also it makes it more likely that your type can be used to compose other arithmetic types. Uh, and fourth, um, smaller, simpler arithmetic types have certain advantages over uh, what I call a kitchen sink solutions or, or comprehensive solutions. For instance, uh, they're more easy to reason about. Um, okay, but before we, before we examine each bullet in detail, um, I'm going to be, I'm, I love examples, so through most of the talk, I'm going to use um, two types. Um, safe integer um, behaves a, a lot like a, a regular built-in integer, except it's intended to catch overflow and uh, other types of um, undefined behavior, specifically at runtime. Uh, this, is a, this is a simplified version of uh, um, a pattern that I've seen uh, in a few libraries now. Uh, in, and um, uh, the idea is that um, you get correctness because um, you know, a, a bad result that you know, is nonsense because uh, it comes from indeterminate values or, or the result of overflow. Um, that cannot sort of uh, escape the point at which things go south. Okay, so here's some examples of how um, safe integer might catch errors. Um, so we're, um, when um, arithmetic operations are performed, um, values can change and they can go outside the range of uh, your, your integer type, and um, that's where we want to catch errors. So um, these, the first three variables, A, B, and C, um, shouldn't ever get a chance to live before they, before they even get assigned. Uh, an exception is going to get thrown by our safe integer type and um, um, incorrectness will be uh, avoided. Um, D is uh, a slightly different um, case because it's, it doesn't relate to overflow. It's, um, it's uh, related to uh, undefined, uh, uninitialized uh, data, which, which means D um, starts off in an, well, so if you um, declare an automatic um, variable, an integer, say, and you don't initialize it with a value, uh, the value is indeterminate. And um, if you read it before you write to it, uh, you have undefined behavior. Um, however, there's, there's various different ways to, to deal with that situation with various trade-offs. Um, and then, okay, the, my second example is um, a, a little more off the beaten track. It's called uh, elastic integer. Um, if anybody wants to come up with a better name for this type, uh, I keep asking people, nobody has come up with anything yet. Um, uh, elastic integer um, tries to, rather than the catch overflow errors at runtime, elastic integer tries to avoid them at compile time. Uh, you'll often find this behavior bundled in with uh, safe integer types. I think um, it's a separate concern. It, it, it deserves a, a type of its own. Um, so it has some really interesting properties. So um, looking at this first example here, we have a, um, a, an elastic integer that has um, four binary digits. Uh, it's unsigned and it can store the value 10. Um, when, you, when you add it to, to itself, um, you're going to get the value 20. You can't, you can't store that in four bits. Uh, no, you can't. <laughs> and, um, and so, <laughs> and so um, what happens is the result B is, um, becomes five bits. It figures out that um, when you add numbers, um, what you need is one extra bit. Well, assuming they're the same size. Uh, technically, it's the, the max of the widths of the two operands plus one. Um, so uh, with, uh, with C, we have, um, we're negating the value. It starts off unsigned, um, 
and now it's signed. So it's uh, so this will be a, a, a five bit signed elastic integer. And um, and as a just to make the point that this is orthogonal to safe integer, D is just going to overflow. That's a you know that's an error. Uh, tough luck. Um, you chose elastic integer. Elastic integer um, doesn't really um, incur any runtime penalties. It's um, it's all about trying to um, avoid overflow before it ever happens. Yes. Question in your slide. Mm -hmm. You were talking about how D would be five bits wide. Mm -hmm. Your slide say nine. Uh, uh, yes. Sorry, that's a typo. Thanks for spelling that. Thank you. Yes. Um, I I have unit tested all of this stuff, but uh. Uh, it seems not to have extended to the uh, comments, unfortunately. Sorry about that. Yes, it's uh, it is five bits. Um, right. Okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're counting the number of digits ah. rather than keeping track of a maximum, effectively taking the logarithm. That's right. Yes. Um, you want to comment on why one or the other? Okay. So the the question is, why would I um, track the number of bits rather than the um, the, the limits of the value. So there's um, um, a bounded integer is a is a type that um, there's a, there's a library which which does exactly that. Um, that's great, except that um, whichever way you track the the limits, you need to represent that as a, a template parameter, a non-type template parameter, which and there are um, quite strict limits on what can be a non-type template parameter. So um, and this, this really wraps nicely in with the um, composability. If, if the type that you are trying to represent, so here in my examples I'm using signed and unsigned um, as the, the underlying type, uh, I might not necessarily be using a fundamental um, arithmetic type, so in which case... Right, yes. So the pathological case is when I, I start off with a, um, an elastic integer with one bit, um, and then I, I, I square and I square and I square again, I end up um, with a, a value that cannot exceed one, but the the, the type um, thinks it needs you know four bits. Um, but for for larger values, um, that that kind of that isn't such a problem. And th this is just a more a more versatile uh, way to express um, the the range that we have to stick within. Right. Okay. So um, so um, we're going to go through. So those were the examples here. The, the example types. And we're going to go through this laundry list of, um, of uh, identifying characteristics. Um, so um, this, the safe integer type I used, um, I'm going to use to look at this. Um, now here's the counterexample of the, the, the safe type that I, I provided here. Um, we're uh, describing this, the safe integer in, in terms of non-type um, parameters only. And this is a, a pattern that I've, I've seen a bunch of times. Rather than providing uh, the the exact integer type that's going to get used in the safe integer, um, a an implementer has decided. Well, we're going to we're going to specify the exact number of digits and whether the um, whether the type is unsigned. And this is this, this seems like quite a tempting thing to do. Um, it's it's a pattern. Uh, it's indicative of a library writer who's um, been grazed by the int's rough edges and thinks I can fix this. And um, that that's a common pattern is that people look at the fundamental types, uh, they identify them as badly broken in many ways, um, think they know how to use them, um, doesn't go so well, and then they kind of think that they're going to fix what's wrong. Um, ints, are not, ints are not nearly as broken as you might think though, um, and it's, they, they, while they do look broke, um, they're, um, they give a really good trade-off um, between speed, uh, storage, and portability. Um, so, so it, with our bad, with our uh, our bad example um, here, we're trying to represent uh, a signed int here by saying they have thirty-one bits. Well, obviously that's that's often true, but not necessarily always. I mean, if you're working on a, a, a your processor is a, a an eight hundred two eight six, or a, or you're working on a Cray system, I'm sure there are there are other slightly less exotic uh, um, hardware. But uh, yeah, it's it's better just if you want if you want the best integer type that's int and you should you should be able to spell that out. So the the way around this is to maybe you know figure out what the how many digits int is and uh, um, spell that out. That this is ugly. It's um, 
uh, the, 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 the counter argument is that if you want to specify the exact number of digits, well, that's, that's easy to do if you, if, you, if you use the type as your um, template parameter. Um, this is kind of, this, this is not fighting against the, the language. This is, this is sort of working with the language. Um, and and just, the, just the specific reasons I've given, they're not even the main reasons from a, a compositional approach why this is the right way to do things. Okay, so number two, um, you, want to, um, you want your type to be substituted for fundamental arithmetic types, if at all possible. So you want to, uh, ideally, you want to be able to drop in the type that you're using to replace existing uh, integers or, or maybe even floating point values. Um, so let's look at the case of a project where runtime performance is paramount, but where we want to catch a lot of bugs during development. Um, uh, a, a games project uh, might well do this kind of thing. It's sort of what happens with a cert. You, um, uh, certs are often enabled in a debug build, and then they just compile out to nothing in a release or, or um, production build. Uh, here we're um, using, we're going to just fall back to raw integers in a production build. We're not going to have any safety guarantees, but in a, a debug build, um, the extra time is going to be spent looking for, uh, trying to catch overflow. So basically, um, the, the program is going to crash or throw an exception or whatever, um, and then the, the developer will you know, debug the problem, make sure it doesn't happen again, and fingers crossed, the uh, production build will be uh, bug-free or close to bug-free. And in video games, uh, it's, it's worth taking the risk um, in order to get the faster code. You just don't want to be checking for these kind of errors in production code. Okay, so what happens um, here, there's a, there's a function that's using, using our um, integer type. Um, so what is this going to return? Um, well, it's a bit of an um, unfair question. You, you can't possibly answer this without knowing what the uh, um, uh, multiply operator is. So let's take a look at that. So um, let's first try and write a naive attempt at a multiplication operator. So this takes uh, two safe integer of reps, returns one safe integer of rep. Uh, rep here um, kind of, it, it means the, 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 the stored value. It's, it's akin to the... Um, the rep uh, type in, um, in the chrono duration um, type, but um, for now, just assume it's, it's an integer. Um, uh, okay, so um, there's, um, oh, also, you see there, uh, we have a, an accessor called data. This gets the underlying um, value. Uh, you could argue this is, this is uh, leaking the abstraction that, um, that we've set up with safe integer, but, um, uh, believe me, it's it's uh, it's a uh, it's a price worth paying. It's, it's like a very deliberate design choice. Um, okay, um, there are two problems uh, with the use of rep here. Okay, firstly, the implementation. Uh, so there's there's implicit conversion when where sum is defined. So you see there. Um, it's probably helpful if I show an example. So let's say rep is uh, short, um, where a and b's data are multiplied together. Um, you're going to get an, an integer back because um, a short multiplied by a short is is going to promote to an int at least uh, at least where short is shorter than int. I would say for sure, yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, it certainly I, I certainly find that it, when I multiply two shorts together, um, I get an int, and. Um, so uh, whether that's assigned to sum on initialization, you have, um, you have an implicit conversion there. It's, it's casting from short back down, uh, from int, sorry, back down to short. Um, that could be inefficient. Um, also, also, yes, this, um, because there's only one rep type, um, you cannot have uh, you know, heterogeneous operands in, in this uh, um, um, being accepted by this uh, function. Um, so we're going to go back to the drawing board and, and try and fix these two problems. Okay, yes. Hi. Isn't a bigger problem over here that the, the commit do some code processing? If the auto has happened in a kind of undefined way, where? Uh -huh. um, yeah, I'm, uh, like if you wanted to know how I do um, overflow checking, so I'm really sorry to disappoint you. Um, <laughs> uh, so, and it's, it's quite tricky to do um, efficiently. 
And, um, oh, sorry, the, the question was, uh, isn't, isn't the real problem that the, the overflow has already occurred at this point? So, well, um, so the way that, um, so if you look at the, um, the GCC built-in uh, overflow checking functions, for example, um, the way that they define their overflow checking is to say they um, take the, the two operands, they multiply them with an infinite width integer, and then they compare that to the, the given um, result type that you want back. And if those two are not equal, then that then overflow has is assumed to have occurred. And um, so, um, uh, yeah, I, 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 there is there is like a you know a whole area of work there involved in what is an efficient way to detect the overflow. And yes, I am totally waving my hands and um, saying that's that's a problem for another talk. That's a whole forty five minutes right there. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, that um, I spent a bunch of time in the product security world and looking at things like this. Mm -hmm. And um, if the overflow has already has occurred, if you've done the multiplication and you want to check the overflow after you've done the operation, mm -hmm. you're screwed. Mm -hmm. Your overflow has happened. You're in undefined behavior land. You have no guarantees that that your tests will be at all accurate. Yep. Um, you have to detect the, the that the overflow will occur before you do the multiplication. Sure. I mean, I am. I'm assuming that this that somewhere in the comments, success occurs. Uh, sorry, the, the the comment was that um, if uh, if uh, overflow has already occurred, then you're you're plain out of luck. And um, uh, yes, you, the the error has already happened. Isn't that signed but not unsigned. Right. Not unsigned. Because unsigned, right. there is no undefined behavior on overflow. It just wraps. Well, but you do get overflow, which you want to detect. Yes, but at least for unsigned, you can detect. Yeah. The overflow, usually. Yeah, it's still a complicated mathematical operation to figure out if you have overflow. Well, I mean, it's it's re in this case it's really easy. You take the, uh, the you go numeric limits max divided by one of the operands and see if it's yeah. bigger than the other mm -hmm. operand. Yes, that's that's operand. easy but costly. Yes. Um, uh, well, uh, uh, so so um, in reality, what you're likely to do is uh, there's going to be an overflow flag that you that you test. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, yeah, so so as I mentioned, there are GCC um, built-in functions that try and try and uh, exploit the hardware to, to do this in efficient in an efficient way. Um, they're quite useful for detecting overflow. Um, say if you want to, you decide that instead of throwing, you decide to saturate instead. Um, they're not so good because they don't tell you whether there was a positive or negative overflow, which you need to know in order to saturate a signed. Uh, integer, for instance, but I am yes, I am totally waving my hands here and, and say and, and saying there is some extra work going on here. But this is an example of how you go about um, defining the operators um, for your type so that they will work well with your rep type. Um, yeah, I, I do have um, some naive implementations of this that 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 half work already, and, and yes, they 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 don't have this problem. Yeah, okay, um, so. Here's our, our repaired, yeah. So I'll just flip back and forth a few times. Fixed, broken, fixed. Um, and so uh, two things have changed here. Firstly, we have two rep types, so, the, so we can have two different uh, operands as our inputs. Also, I am uh, deducing the, the result of sum. So uh, in our first example, again, where rep one is short and rep two is also short, uh, sum is going to be int um, because um, you don't get arithmetic operations happening. Uh, uh, yes, it, it, implicit um, promotion um, the, occurs. So why is it any two shorts to an int? If you have two ints, it's also an int. It's also an int. Um, Isn't that well inconsistent? Now that you widen to the product type, what we do. Okay, so, well. I am. I'm trying to work with the C rules, um, and so th that's a problem with the int. That's not a problem with uh, the safe integer. It's a problem with how promotion. It's great when it promotes stuff up to 32 bits on a you know on, on a system with 32-bit int. But um, say you you might want to go beyond that, and then you have a you have a problem because you don't you don't promote wider than than int. Uh, elastic integer addresses that problem. So, so the, so, um, yeah, the, uh, the, the comment was um, just about the, how the rules, the, the rules of implicit uh, 
promotion are kind of quirky and have, are problematic. And this is exactly the sort of thing people discover and they think, oh no, Int is really broken. I'm going to fix it. And um, it's kind of, it's a mistake to do that. Um, it's, yes, there, there are problems. It can be surprising what the, the behavior of Int is, but it comes up with something that usually um, gets you the right result and is usually very, very fast and is also usually very, very portable. And it, it, there's trade-offs there and Int is, um, you'd be surprised just how good the choice of trade-offs is with Int. Um, it takes a while for you to realize that, I think. Uh, so in our second example, we have a heterogeneous um, op operands or, or mixed operands. These will be taken care of. Um, okay, so now, so in the previous slide uh, here, um, that second, that second uh, operation wouldn't compile. Now it's going to compile. And um, so there's, we, we're working with um, the, the language and uh, we're using auto type deduction um, to the maximum here. Um, we're deducing the, ret um, the return type. Uh, we're also deducing the, the type of sum here. And in C++ 17, you see on the, on the return line where I have to specify the, um, the template um, parameter um, in, in C++ 17, you can get rid of that, and it figures out from the type of sum what the um, what the template parameter of safe integer should be, which is which is very nice um, class template deduction. Okay, right. Um, so the, the the conclusions from that is uh, when you use a types operator, don't assume it's return type. It, it, you, you might not know, you might never come across the type that you're going to need to handle yet. It might not have been written when you write your operator. Um, but that's just for arithmetic operators. Um, say for comparison, it's safe to return bool, right? Yeah, uh, it's not. So, I mean, th this is a bit of an extreme example that was pointed out to me by uh, Joel, who, who works on the Cindy um, library. But in this example, you're maybe going to pass in uh, a, a pack of four ints, and they're going to be compared to an, another pack of four ints, and you're going to get back four bools, basically. Uh, so even for comparison, you cannot assume that, um, that bool is going to be the return type. You really have to keep a very open mind about the behavior of the, uh, the underlying type that you're trying to wrap. OK, uh, so returning to our square function, um, it now returns um, int or, or a safe integer of int, no matter what the build. So it's, it's going to have the same value in it. Um, either way, um, it, uh, which, is, which is a good thing. Um, and does this because the operator tries as hard as possible not to interfere with the operations of its rep type. And I call this the, the prime directive of composite arithmetic types, because it is rather like the, um, the prime directive from Star Trek, uh, which uh, uh, if, you, if you're unfamiliar with Star Trek, well, shame on you. It's uh, um, often the, the crew of the, the um, SS Enterprise will uh, land on a planet where they haven't discovered aliens yet and they have to totally put on really cheesy um, makeup and pretend they're also aliens so that the alien race aren't freaked out. And uh, yeah. Um, okay. So next up, we start to fit the pieces together. I mean, you start to see a common theme here, composability, 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 but you've kind of seen sort of the, the, the the top and the bottom of the, the Lego brick now. And uh, so um, now we see the, all the pieces start to come together. Uh, the reason I've given you um, two arithmetic types is because we don't want to just um, specialize them within, we want to specialize them with each other. Okay, so there's a third type, uh, something that returns widened results where possible and performs runtime overflow checks everywhere else. So you get the best of both worlds here. Um, and so this, this isn't actually a, a class that we're going to, we're not going to write a whole other third class. We're going to just create an alias which wraps one of our types inside the other. Okay, so um, by the way, I'm, I'm adding um, template parameter defaults here. So narrowest um, defaults to int here. Um, narrowest is kind of like the, the rep type. Uh, but with some caveats, because obviously if you multiply big numbers together, you're going to get something wider than an int. But we, we don't want to 
uh, let overflow occur in those situations. Okay, so um, right here, rep one is um, is an elastic integer of, um, of with four bits, um, and it's signed. Uh, rep two is an elastic integer of three. Okay, um, when we sum them, um, we're going to get yeah, we, we're going to get a result that's uh, seven bits wide. And we know this this is not going to overflow because we know that there's there's no values of the operands that can cause overflow in a seven bit um, integer. Um, however, this is a safe this is a safe integer type, so we're going to be performing that um, uh, overflow test. We're going to be wasting our time here. That's not good. Um, so so um, the solution is pretty pretty easy and. Um, uh, that is to just perform a check, uh, basically the, the, the check I just described. Take the, um, the digits needed by each type, 4 plus 3, um, and check to see if the, the inputs require more capacity than the outputs. Um, and and uh, in this case, that's not going to happen. Um, and in, in C++17, this, this uh, conditional here um, can be uh, uh, if const expr. Oh const expr if, um, because uh, digits, the, the value of digits is known at compile time. Um, but doesn't it seem a little wrong adding a special case into safe integer just in order to accommodate elastic integer? Does that just seem a bit like you're cheating? Well, um, not really. It's not a special case. Um, if, for example, we were multiplying two shorts or two um, uh, uint eights, for instance, uh, we do. We still get. We still know that we're never going to um, get overflow because those values are promoted to int. So the same test will determine that for even for fundamental types, there's no need. And again, yes, uh, the, the the horse may have bolted at this point in this particular um, the, the way this has been written out. Um, but but the, the the check is the check is still valid. Um, it's just the the in, the internals of this function need to be written correctly. I mean, one thing I could do is, uh, um, in, in the do some overflow checking, I could um, uh, cast a, a data and B data to an infinitely wide type, multiply them, then compare to sum. So it's, it's, it's quite possible to, to just fill in that comment with something that does possibly inefficiently, but does uh, catch overflow. Um, Right, so, so here, here we see um, it, if, you, if, you, um, if you design your types well, they work well together, they work well in conjunction with uh, fundamental types. Um, now, uh, number four, um, separation of concerns. Well, so, uh, yes. On the previous slide, you had, um, just going to go back one slide, mm -hmm. you have the numeric limit check. Um, how does this cooperate with other types, such as the SIMD uh, types? Ah, well, with um, so so th your, the question is um, with the use of numeric limits here. Um, how would that interact with use of SIMD? Um, that's a good question. One I haven't considered, but I would, I, I'd have to look at um, how um, SIMD types have been. Um, how numeric limits has been specialized for SIMD types, uh, if at all. Uh, you, you, do, you do really have to uh, specialize um, numeric limits for types you expect to, to behave well with other types. Um, I, would, I would hope that digits refers to the number of digits of the individual elements in the pack. And if so, say you had um, um, a pack of uh, char, then um, digits would be seven or eight, uh, hopefully. But that's a good question. Uh, yes, another question? Yeah, he, he touched on something I was thinking of here. So, mm -hmm. how does, say, elastic integer play, well, play with numeric limits? Um, the question is, how does, how does elastic integer uh, play with uh, numeric limits? Well, you have, to, you have to specialize numeric limits for elastic integer. And then for the digits member, for instance, um, the value of that would be the digits um, non-type template parameter of elastic integer. So if you had um, a four-bit elastic integer, um, then digits would equal four. Um, yeah, that, look, that starts getting very strange because 
you say, just because the types keep changing out for you, you compare something against the max, and you know, and suddenly you, you have values that are bigger because some arithmetic operation returns you back a different size. Um, yes. Different so the comment is that um, you get different results because there are different specializations of elastic integer. Mm -hmm. Well, for each different uh, specialization of elastic integer, there is uh, an accompanying um, specialization of numeric limits. And so um, for each one, the number of digits, for instance, matches and is signed matches. So if, for instance, uh, all of those things. Uh, one one uh, interesting point is that uh, the for elastic integer, least negative uh, was it most negative value is not allowed. So the the max is equal to the um, is is neg is uh, minus lowest, and vice versa. Um, I I I just figured this is a, like a, one of the problems that the numerics TS um, wants to ad address, and I think elastic integer is probably the best place to deal with that. But yeah, max is taken to be one shift left number of digits. And there's some interesting um, situations where, say, you've got a 4-bit elastic integer, but you're using an int under the hood to represent it. Well, what happens if you um, uh, do a bitwise not of that value? What, what, are the, what are the other 28 bits? What, what's going on with them? Um, it's interesting questions. You, you might argue, maybe don't do bitwise um, operations on signed integers. Uh, but yeah, it's an open design question. Yes, it's well. It's 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 a huge topic. Um, it's it's really not as simple as it appears um, up front. I wish I could go back two years and, and warn myself that really. <laughs> okay, so okay, um, so all right. Separation of concerns. We've, I've kind of covered it by by showing how I have these two different types. They both do two very specific things, uh, and then they can be combined uh, to deal with both of them together. Um, so okay, um, continue on. Um, I've been working on a, a couple of other types which are designed to be components because uh, uh, two is um, just the bare minimum to show how to combine stuff. So fixed point is, um, is the thing I've worked on the most. Um, so here again, we have elastic integer um, for completeness. Um, precise integer is a type which um, does nice rounding. So if, say, if you um, convert, um, assign 0.7 to a precise integer, uh, with the default rounding type of round to closest, instead of being truncated to zero, like an integer would, it will be rounded up to one, which um, um, that's, uh, uh, for certain applications, that's uh, a, a really big deal. And, and incidentally, uh, again, integers can be kind of surprising or confusing. Sometimes um, you perform an operation and you get truncation. Other times you uh, round towards negative infinity. And um, so you think, you think you know int, and then, and then it, it kind of surprises you with, with other weirdness. Um, so yeah, if that, if that really knocks you, use precise integer. OK, uh, the fourth type, uh, safe integer, we've um, visited before. But this is sort of a more um, typical uh, safe integer. It's got a second parameter that allows the user to customize what happens when overflow occurs. I mentioned saturation. Um, in future um, revisions we, uh, of the standard, um, we might want to use um, contracts to catch overflow. Um, or you might just not want to do anything. You might want overflow for signed integers, or sort of wraparound for signed integers, um, UB for unsigned integers. That, that's, that's something people ask for. OK, and here is all of them combined together. It's like something out of a, um, it, well, it reminds me of the, the last section of Fox and Socks, actually, like when Tweetle Beetles battle in a puddle battle bottle. Um, this, is a, this is a real type. I have got this to compile. I can even um, perform some operations with it. Um, but there's a lot of work involved in, in making this um, work with every single you know, combination of uh, rounding modes, overflows, um, all the different sort of signed and unsigned uh, integers underlying it. And in order to do this efficiently, um, there's a lot of work involved with it. Um, but I've, I'm, I'm, try, I, I'm required to prove out that this stuff is possible. And uh, um, in, in, in one sense, it's kind of it's horrendous. But in another, it's, uh, um, it's kind of amazing that, that the language will let you do things like this. 
Okay. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested to, to know for, you know, um, user's point of view or compiler implementer's point of view, um, how practical this is. I mean, uh, presumably, um, if this stuff got standardized, the aliases would also be standardized. And this would basically just be a way to build up an interface. The, the, hopefully, the user wouldn't have to write out stuff like this on a regular basis unless they had very specific um, requirements. Okay. So another um, combination which is quite interesting is fixed point plus elastic integer. Um, when, when you have um, fixed point types, they, um, it, it's much easier to, to get overflow with them because you're often filling the, all the bits with information. Whereas, you know, with, uh, with, with integers, you might be you know, multiplying the, the number of fingers on your left hand by the, the um, I don't know, n number of ears or something. Uh, it's usually small numbers. <laughs> but, um, but when you're using integers for fixed point, suddenly you're, you're saturating your range and, and the risk of overflow is much greater. Um, so here in this example, um, I'm showing two different ways you can square um, a value using um, fixed point. Uh, obviously, it's not the most um, efficient thing to do. Um, but so in the, in the top version, we're just using integers. And, and so pre fixed point library, um, we have, this is how you have to um, do fixed point, is to remember in your head what the scale is of the, um, and the values you're storing, which is, is a, there's a real gotcha there where um, when converting that to float, you have to remember that you've, um, you've squared the value and so the, the exponent has changed. In the lower version, um, uh, all of that is taken care of for you by the type system and you get the same results from both of these functions. And um, so you've, you've seen the page with all the memes on it. That's, that's uh, one obligatory slide in a, in a talk. And the other one, of course, is some, uh, go, some Godbolt. So this is the two functions that you um, saw from the last slide. Um, this is the assembly that's produced by them just on, on GCC 4.9 with optimization turned up. The, um, here in this case, it's, this is kind of proving that this is a zero cost abstraction. Um, I don't, I don't fully understand what the assembler is doing. I'll, I'll admit it. The important thing is it's identical. Um, okay. Okay. <clears throat> so um, you may have heard of uh, boost multi precision, um, and that's a, as another example of a composition that I've uh, been uh, playing with. Um, here's an example of me taking using um, boost multi precision as the rep type of fixed point. So I now have a, a fixed point type with 400 integer digits. And that's enough digits to represent a Google, which is um, uh, 10 to the 100. And um, which you can do with multi-precision anyway. But it being a fixed point multi-precision, you can then um, get the, the inverse of that. And you have a Google. -th, um, which, and, and it took relatively little um, effort to make multi-precision work with, with fixed point because boost multi-precision behaves pretty well for, for such an incredible type. Um, so there is some small print, um, uh, some glue that you do need to um, implement in order to, to let some types work with others. Um, so for instance, you, you need to be able to um, make, make a type signed or unsigned. So for instance, if you have a, um, an unsigned elastic integer and you negate it, you need to convert to the unsigned um, equivalent type. Now, that's easy to do with, with uh, ints because there are um, facilities, I think, in, in the type traits header to do that. But you're not allowed to specialize those for your own custom types. Here I'm doing something um, with std make sign t, which I'm, which I'm not allowed to do uh, um, according to the standard. And so we need, we need a way to um, allow that for arbitrary types. And another one is... Um, um, to be able to specify the, the width of a type. So say I have a, an int, I might want specifically to have a 16-bit version of an int, which, is, which happens to be a short. Um, I want to be able to do that for built-in types, and I want to be able to do that also for the custom types that I write. And, and this is kind of essential to, let, to, to make things like uh, elastic integer and fixed point work properly. Um, so... Uh, there are a bunch of other things that, that, that need to um, be supported. And uh, I think maybe a numeric traits um, type might be something that are uh, rather like numeric limits. Um, we should 
um, think about um, providing in the, in the standard in order to make uh, numeric types interoperable. Um, here's, how, here's how the safe integer numeric traits type might, or part of it might look. Um, so that's, that's me. Um, uh, thanks for coming. Um, here's some uh, papers to, to peruse through and uh, um, I have a, a, an input, a reference implementation of fixed point which includes all of these other sort of um, types at some f stage of development or other. Some of them are missing uh, operators or, or what have you but uh, uh, yes I'd invite you to, to check those out and uh, um, yeah um, any questions? Yes. So you're obviously working in the standards arena on this. What is, mm -hmm. the, what is the plan? Okay. All right. Well, so the question is, what, what's the plan vis-a-vis -vis standardization? Um, so there's kind of uh, two, sep two separate things going on. I'm, I'm uh, um, proposing a fixed point type, um, but at the same time, there is talk of a numeric technical specification. And... Um, uh, it's it's kind of it's just not done that, that two people are proposing two bits of overlapping functionality at the same time. So um, so Lawrence Crowell, the um, uh, the I guess chair of uh, um, SGE six, is wor uh, has been working on numeric types, and so we've started to to um, collaborate and try and um, incorporate um, this approach into the existing numeric TS, which mostly involves me proving that it's possible and that. Uh, types like the, the ones that you've seen here are generally useful and efficient um, and, and don't kill compile times too badly. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, yes. So um, when you have uh, like four bit integer type, mm -hmm. and inside your, you must be representing this like a wider integer. So yes. Okay, that's a good question. The question is, if I have a four-bit integer and I'm using an int, I guess a 32-bit int under the hood, um, well, if I know, so for the specific case of elastic integer, I, I will be testing against um, a numeric limits max. Um, say I'm adding two numbers together, well, I take, um, I'll take max minus one of those numbers and, and, and compare it to the other. Um, uh, if there is some intrinsics or some built-ins such as the ones GCC supplies which make it possible to test for overflow in a really uh, machine efficient way, I'll, I'll try to use those. But generally, um, uh, yes, it's just uh, doing comparisons of the, of the difference really. It depends on the op operation. If you compare, they will be equal because the integer you are representing does not uh, show overflow because it is a valid thing in that specific case. Right, so um, so if you say say you multiply two elastic integers together and you get back um, something that's that's a wider result, um, the the check that I, I showed in the the multiply operator will will identify that it's never possible for overflow to occur in that, that operation, and so the overflow check will um, be skipped in the, in that case. Okay. Uh, it, it's things like compound assignment, for instance, uh, for instance, where you do times equals. In, in that situation, you cannot come back with a wider elastic integer than you started with. Uh, and in, in those situations, then you absolutely do have to check for overflow at runtime. That's inevitable. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks.